welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we are speaking with Danny Nemu. Danny is a writer, presenter, and researcher in the fields of psychedelics and the history of science. He is the author of Science Revealed and Neuro Apocalypse, and joins us today to talk about entheogens in culture. Danny, welcome aboard. Hello, Gordon. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh... The traditional first question should be interesting. Danny, were you a weird kid? Um, no, I don't think I was a weird kid. I think everyone else was weird. Um, and I kind of still maintain that. Um, I remember a guy at school who could rattle off the goal scorers from the last 20 or 30 years of World Cups. And I thought that was a very weird thing to turn your attention towards. And I, uh, to be honest, I couldn't really tell you what colour England plays in at the moment um so no i i don't think i was a weird kid i think i was always interested in quite weird things and i was quite um i was quite inquisitive like inquisitive about normally about why people think certain things that they think or why people think anything in particular rather than anything else and if you inquire far enough into why someone thinks something it's normally because of conventions i was never very good with conventions so perhaps unconventional yeah um were you from like a unconventional or iconoclastic family that uh, shared similar views, or were you the black sheep? Um, I think no. I think my um, I think the unconventionality was was kind of partly uh, ne- neurological. Really, I kind of uh, I was going to say suffered, but I haven't suffered. I profited from being uh, somewhere on the autistic spectrum or on the Asperger's spectrum, and kind of uh, people like that tend to struggle with. You know, like, for example, left and right, left and right are conventional concepts. You know, I'm pretty good with this side of the thing and that side of the thing. When I was growing up, I had to check. um, I remember I used to check which side my heartbeat was on in order to know which side was left and which side was right. So, you know, when I'm on my bicycle and I approach a um, a roundabout, uh, even today, I always get confused. which, Which side do I have to give way on? And that kind of spreads out into everything, really. So, uh, yeah, conventions. No, my 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 dad, who's uh, actually uh, much more Asperger's than I am, um, he I guess he dealt with it by being extremely conventional uh, in a way. That was kind of uh, his response. Um, yeah, Asperger's tend to tend to like get some routines down. So I've got some routines which make things. Uh, much easier so i uh you know when i get home i know exactly where i'm putting my keys and stuff but on more philosophical areas yeah i was always kind of inquiring as to why and it's never it's never been good enough just because it is because things are so and you know you inquire far enough and normally behind behind a convention there's either there's normally violence behind a convention really you know why does uh why does a certain country end where it ends and why does the next country begin where it begins is because a battle was fought there um and also, you look see that in the academy as well. Um, why do people believe certain things? Why do certain disciplines uh, have certain um, certain dogmas? I suppose, and it seems to be because that's where the last battle was fought. So I've never really yeah. satisfied with that uh, violence or fear. Eh? The, yeah, that's what creates boundaries. I think that's uh, interesting. It's interesting you talk about the directionality stuff. Uh, my boss um, slash first mentor in New Zealand uh, was hugely dyslexic and um, we were out at a meeting with um, some important clients and he looked down at his hand and made um, an L shape. So he opened up his, his index finger and thumb and that's how that was his shortcut rather than the heartbeat to go, okay, if it makes an L, that's the left. <laughs> we go right, in that I direction. See, yeah. Um, that would have been easier. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that, but maybe not if you're like, oh no, even with your hands on a, on the bicycle handles, you could still kind of see that it's an F. But there you go, little little tip. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I I got to my mid twenties before I realized the left hand makes uh, an L if you're looking at it. But uh, yeah, yeah, fascinating. So, uh, was it, I mean. What were some of the books or experiences you had at that kind of young age, if you're already sort of, you know, neurodivergent and everyone else but you was weird? Um, how did that manifest mm. in terms of kind of intellectual um, intellectual curiosity and, and examining boundaries and conventions? Well, I kind of, I kind of read everything. You know, I was, um, I was into comics and I was into, uh, I was into the um, the Discworld stuff. I remember reading them. I remember. Um, I remember the, the, one of the Discworld books. It was uh, Pyramids, 
Uh, and it was the first book that made me laugh out loud. And I was actually in bed and my, my folks came into my room and they were like, what, what, what's going on with you? And I was laughing at this particular scene where I think it's, the, it's one of the camels in pyramids is they're the best mathematicians in the universe. And this camel's tr- like a calculating trajectory of some spit that he's about to fire. Um, yeah, so I spent a lot of time um, reading and um, uh, what else? Uh, I, I used to play. Um, I used to play a lot of chess. I used to go to chess um, kind of uh, contests. I used to play at kind of uh, at county level until I hit puberty. Really, that 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 did for that. But I used to forget the days because I was always rubbish with dates. And um, you know, I still don't know my sister's birthdays. My apologies to to them for that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I love chess when I managed to arrive on the right day. Um, <laughs> What else? I got quite into music. Um, you know, I like playing drums, and I still like playing music. Uh, but yeah, I think I was quite bookish, basically. Right. Were you from a uh, religious or spiritual household, and or was your house haunted or anything like that? Um, well, it's kind of an interesting question. My immediate family was, uh, and I guess still is, Reformed Jewish, which is kind of about as unspiritual as it gets. Um, <laughs> It seems to me this is a, uh, uh, it, 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 yeah, I, I could say all kinds of things about where, with, the, with the direction that Judaism has gone as uh, after the foundation of the state of Israel, but I'll maybe not go there. But my granny um, on my mother's side was a, well, she was a very, um, well, she was a member of the Arthurian Society. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but they were headed by a, a gentleman called Dr. George King, who was a, said to be a Western master of yoga. I think he was a, a drunken taxi driver, by all accounts, who hit upon the idea of starting a cult. But his cult was very interesting. They used to do um, alien contact uh, type things. So my granny used to take me on her knee and tell me about what was going on in Venus, the industrial planet, and transmissions from Mars Sector 6, and all this kind of stuff. And she used to go up Holy Mountain once a year with her, with her gang. Um, and basically, this, the, the Dr. George King had invited the ascended masters threw his body into these seven holy mountains i might have a few of the details here wrong and it energized these mountains so the arthurian society people used to go up these mountains and form a circle around batteries and then pray into these batteries and release the batteries at times of great spiritual uh, and also geological problems so when there was an earthquake or something off they'd go and they'd they kind of release their batteries and they're very into operations like operation prayer power for example so when they had flying saucers um were visiting then your prayer and your healing would be uh kind of potentiated so so she was great actually my granny she 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 gave me a very interesting perspective on any kind of cosmology from a very young age you know because it was very clear to me that people believe all kinds of strange things and uh and why would you believe like i say why would you believe one thing um over over another and the other side of it was she was actually a, she was an accomplished healer she used to she was a, 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 a spiritual healer so she would place hands on and she taught me how to do some visualizations when i was quite young and um used to um basically fix diseases by the application of hands so that was another thing you know and and she was quite respected by uh the rest of my family i guess as somebody whose hands definitely did something although the kind of stuff that she believed in was absolutely bonkers yeah i was gonna say what was uh what was the rest of the family's opinion of grandma in a cult uh yeah well um yeah i think i mean the cult was very very strange it still is very 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 strange um her funeral was amazing actually uh they had a um a chap in a purple tunic with a great big ohm around his neck. And the, it was a, a fusion of kind of Anglican ideas and spaceships and kind of uh, Buddhist y, Hindu, kind of somewhat influenced by theosophists, um, I think. And so, yeah, I can remember him at the. Um, at the funeral and he started up by putting his arms out in a, in a great cross and going home shanty 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 and then off we went and he was talking about um how what how what, what babies are trying to say when they speak and all these crazy visualizations and and everyone else was from this very very interesting uh spiritual lineage and there was me and my brother straight family i was absolutely loving it it was by far the best funeral i've ever been to um yeah always uh yeah it was pretty strange 
Yeah, and then cool. my grandmother on the other side was um, she was a graphologist as well. So you know that my interest in divination. Um, I don't know if it's you know I, I I kind of picked up an interest in that later, but there was a, an interest in. I guess graphology is examining the signs on the surface to work out what is going on underneath, and that's really what I'm about when I when I'm looking at um, uh, well divination for one thing, which is one of the things I'm into, but also um, just looking at the the superstructure of or, or looking at looking at the surface of society to work out what the forces underneath are, and also in um, also looking at how people behave. In my my day job, I'm a hypnotherapist, so you're looking for very kind of slight clues in the way that people behave the way people react to certain things and then uh, once you've got a fairly good idea of what's going on inside their heads you put them into a trance and you go down to the deep levels and start moving moving things around and uh i mean what was it about hypnotherapy was that something you found young or is that something you found uh, later on as part of an inquisitive quest or that kind of thing uh, I wish I'd found it. It's one of those things that I really wish I'd known how to do when I was a younger man. It would have been very useful. When I was young, I, I was insomniac uh, all my life, really, um, up until I started writing my first book when things changed. But basically, I developed all kinds of different, um, I guess I call them meditations or um, concentration exercises uh, by myself. Like, for example, like I remember I used to have an image of somebody walking around a square, for example, uh, every step connected to one breath and that was just a kind of survival mechanism or you know uh, to try and get myself to sleep um so yeah i was always kind of experimenting with um different ways of kind of chilling out my own mind as well there's another thing of, of people on the spectrum I, you know and also i have quite had have and had quite a raging racing uh, and uh voracious mental appetite i think and at least until i until i encountered until i started me- self-medicating with with um all kinds of lovely plants uh that was that was quite difficult to get hold on and then no but so no um i, I used to do and i have done still do public performance ritual as well um uh occasionally and when i've um when I, even when i was teaching because uh, I was an English teacher for many years, uh, I used to do visualizations with the kids. I was teaching math. I remember teaching translation by getting kids to uh, visualize pentacles in the air and making them flip. So I was, I was often using magical techniques in my day job and in my own in my own mind. But now, actually, as a professional hypnotherapist, that's come much more much more recently. I just finished training uh, just just uh, earlier on this year. Oh, and, congrats! Uh, Thank you. It's fantastic. Yeah. They're really, really enjoying it. It's brilliant. Nice one. So, I mean, you mentioned uh, some lovely plants there. Tell us about your first psychedelic experience. Oh, first psychedelic. Mm, let me think about that. Golly. Uh, well, I got into cannabis quite young, uh, probably about 15 or so. And that was, uh, it really, really helped me out uh, in a big way. I always found it very, very pleasant and very very creative and inspiring but then when i was when i was kind of growing up i guess we're talking about what well, i'm 40 now so uh you know, i was a teen in the 90s and so we had some quite a kind of rave culture it's the tail end of rail cu- rave culture i suppose and i was never very good at um the psychedelics in um large rooms full of strangers and that kind of thing so i had a few yeah, kind of scrapes. I think um, I've, I was much better in uh, either in nature or in in ritual. So I mean, I think my my, my early psychedelic experiences were often uh, you know, kind of mind blowing, but also quite terrifying. And um, I remember one in particular that was probably when would that have been? It would have been around the age of about twenty or so. Um, where I I bombed a whole load of speed, and uh, I was I had I, I par- was par- was quite seriously paranoid for about ten days, hearing footsteps behind me and uh, shadows moving around. And I remember I had to, I was working at Yellow Pages at the time, and I remember looking up at the um, at the copy that I was typing up into the computer, and it was a list of uh, rather than being um, an advert for sheds or something, it was a list of all my faults. 
<laughs> staring back at me. Um, but he, you know, even even that was quite. Um, oh, I mean, that's that's in my, my my second book. One of the chapters begins with the with that story, and it was a real um, a kind of uh, a lens on just how uh, how much the what we see is processed by what's going on. Uh, before it before it gets into the into the conscious mind so that really got me thinking as well about what else is warped what else is twisted by the time we perceive it see that i um i didn't realize uh, i'm familiar with yellow pages style jobs but when i was in my early 20s and doing similar things like taking way too much speed on a school night. Um, I was working for Virgin Records, so you'd go into work the next day, and it was expected that you'd be messed up. So uh, I can't imagine having done kind of classified ad stuff in my youth as well. Yeah. Gosh, way to make that job worse. <laughs> um, it, it, indeed, yeah. No, I, haven't, I, haven't really, I haven't really looked back. You know, I, I gave it up on that day, and um, I, I like things more more ritually arranged I, i'm all into ritual really and um i kind of i know we were talking about convention i'm very happy with conventions uh, as long as i know what they're doing there and as long as i know when they begin and when they end so the particular spiritual lineage which i'm involved in at the moment is is daily and uh, for me the the more uh, the more old, the more old school and the more um what's the word i don't say rigid um, situated, but, um, yeah, yeah, situated. I think that's 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 probably good. That's probably a good word for it. Um, the better, because I find if you know what the what the rules are, what you're expected to do, and what you're not expected to, you can kind of it's like walls. You know, if you've got a wall, you can lean against it. Whereas if you don't, you know, uh, you can get lost. So I got lost around a few free parties. I can remember some rather awful experiences. Uh, <laughs> Um, at, at some at some squat parties and at some freeze parties as I was as I was growing up. All right, so let's because uh, I because I'm a serious researcher. I was looking on your about page. Uh, yeah. Let's talk maybe about perhaps your most transformative psychedelic experience because you mentioned Daimi there. So do you want to tell us you know that kind of story and how you ended up in Daimi? Um, yeah. Okay. So, well, I've been involved. I got involved with Dami in Japan. Actually, my ex-wife, um, who didn't speak very much um, English at the time, she said, "Do you want to go to a um, a crazy uh, a crazy drugs party?" To be honest, that's what she said. And I said, uh, "Yeah, of course." And off we went. And when I arrived, we. You know, it was the women were on one side and the men were on the other, and there were crosses, and there were uh, people were dressed in blue and white um, outfits, and you know, ties and, and 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 white shirts and gold stars and all the rest. And I was, I, I was like, what the hell am I doing here? You know, and I, I made a beeline to the nearest, um, well, the only other, um, the only other foreigner, the only other white guy there, and I said, is this a church? And he said, yeah, it's a funky church. And, uh, and off we oh went. Oh, God, really. and you still of... joined. If someone had said that to me, I'm like, mm. thank you for your time. <laughs> I'm going to oh, leave. No, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I kind of, um, well, I'm glad I did. I, I sat contemptuous as they, uh, as they began the prayer, and then I drank. And um, um, I felt suddenly very Jewish, actually, I must say, when I, when I encountered all these crosses and, um, and so on and so forth. But, um, no, it was really interesting. And um, I, 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 in my background, I guess my um, occult background is chaos magic. So I was always quite happy to take on a reality tunnel, if you like, for a, uh, for a distinct period, as long as I knew there was going to be an end to it. Um, so I kind of cut my teeth there in Japan. I drank there for five years. Uh, and Is it, I, I mean, it's in- not typically a known spiritual home of Daimi. I mean, is it popular there? Um, it kind of fits. I mean, is it popular? Yeah, there's a couple of different groups, or at least there were when I was there, and it kind of fits with their... Uh, nature in a way because Japanese are they're very dedicated you know and Daimi requires quite a lot of dedication you've got to learn a whole load of Portuguese songs and you've got to stand up and go from right to left from right to left from right to left and you know beat a maracab uh, you know percussion instrument all the way through and it, it it asks you to be quite disciplined and quite uniform as well that's one of the things which a lot of people you know it kind of it, it kind of breaks you in a way in a rather good way because we have an idea, certainly in, in Europe and uh, I think Australia as well, that um, we should be individuals. And the Japanese don't have that idea. You know, the, the idea is uh, a mature person is someone who's interdependent rather than independent. And in fact, if you're independent, they call it wagamama, which means kind of my way. 
if you like. And that's that's not a sign of maturity or integration. That's a sign of of quite the opposite. You know, that's a sign of not being uh, of, of being immature. If you want to if you want to stick out all the time, and that can be quite abrasive to a uh, well, certainly was abrasive to me when I first when I first encountered it. But I, I'm I'm very grateful for it. You know, it kind of um, it it uh, people say about Daimi, it's much too weird for straight people, and it's it's much too straight for quite a lot of weird people as well quite a lot of hippies basically um must be unkind um so uh yeah um it was fairly uh, some big groups in japan and then i you know my my um i had a whole bunch of very formative experiences there i can remember you know things like realizing that i was a complete idiot that was quite a good one um and um but then uh, when i went to brazil so i came back to england for about a year and a half uh after i lived in in japan for six years which was wonderful and then after a year and a half in england i went off to brazil and in brazil i got bitten by a sandfly and sandfly gave me a disease called leishmaniasis and uh, in portuguese it's called leishmaniosa which is a beautiful word but it's um it's a bacterial colony basically so it bit me just underneath the chest on the left side or just underneath the nipple, basically, and um, it made it. It made a pimple, and the pimple expanded, and it just continued expanding until I had this kind of crater of uh, you know, a bacterial colony feeding on my flesh. And the next stage of this disease is um, it attacks the cartilage in your nose and your ears and your stomach and stuff, and it can really make a mess of your face. And um, and I'd gone out to brazil with very specific two very specific goals and one of those was to learn uh more about about daimi and about the roots of daimi and about the power of of daimi um and when i say daimi i'm talking about ayahuasca p- plus the ritual there and the other thing was i was halfway through writing a book and i wanted you know, the book was about many things including um the history of medicine, for example, which is my academic background, but also autonomy and uh, anarchy and magic and all those wonderful things. Um, so it was a real opportunity. And there I was. I was very ill. Everybody there um, thought I should take injections of antimony and tartrate. And I'd studied this kind of thing in, uh, you know, back at university. Uh, on on how interventionist pharmacological medicine has been pushing out more indigenous and traditional medical modality so i'd see you know i'd, I'd seen this uh, played out and i didn't buy i didn't buy that story at all I, I think that the jungle has cures for jungle complaints so i decided i was going to treat it with ayahuasca i was going to, was going to treat it with daimi and uh, and i did so i spent eight months um quite ill you know i lost 10 kilos and i lost um I lost that 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 wife actually. She she come out to she came out to Brazil and that all went horribly wrong again as it had actually gone horribly wrong in Japan. So note to self, don't get back with the next wife. <laughs> and um yeah, I mean sometimes it takes a little while to get the message, but um uh you know, it took away a whole load of things that I didn't need. Uh and also and it was a test. It was a really interesting test and the crux of it was this. It was like there I was. I was writing this book. The book was about um autonomy in a way uh about taking control away, uh, away from all the various different institutions and um perceptions and a whole load of stuff which uh, which takes away your autonomy so um i wanted to cure myself i wanted to learn about ayahuasca and i did so part of that um involved i was drinking every day for about four months at four o'clock in the morning and um yeah it was absolutely marvelous um were there any topical treatments um for the leishmaniasis i mean how do you how do you cure something that is a you know bacterial attack with uh ingesting uh, a, a psychedelic um well that goes quite right to the root of it really mm-hmm. um that's the miracle of um incarnation yeah uh what is our body and who is in charge of it really um so how do you cure something ayahuasca is not particularly known for treating that particular disease um i did put it on topically i put ayahuasca on my on the wound itself and i also used other things i used like the the, uh the bark of uh some different trees mulatera and a mango tree and a cashew tree and uh i also did some fasts i i was doing lemon fasts um to purify my blood so i was drinking the juice of 
one lemon first thing in the morning and then fasting for three hours and then not eating any and then you know lots of lemon during the day and the second morning you do it with two lemons third day three lemons you go all the way up to 10 lemons then the 11th day you go down to 11 nine lemons so you do a kind of increasing number of lemons first thing in the morning i did that twice so the second time i started at two and went up to 20 lemons first thing in the morning and then back down again but the main thing was was ayahuasca and it was um it was the it was the sessions around that ayahuasca that happened so for example you know we've got songs uh one of the songs goes uh now te medo de morrer se sai correndo é pior para você which means don't be scared of dying and if you run away it's going to get worse for you and there was one particular occasion where i did something which you really can't do in dime uh, and that was i ran away i left to work uh halfway through um, I was having a terrible time, and the next day, you know, it was absolutely clear that my my wound was larger, the inflammation was larger, mm-hmm. and it was serious. So I, 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 and there's lots of hymns like that. Um, there's one that goes "Cura tudo, expulsa tudo, com poder do Pai Eterno," which means I cure everything, I expel everything with the uh, with the power of the uh, the the, uh, the Eternal Father. And um, I kind of tested those against myself, you know. And I wasn't naive. I wasn't naive to dye me. I'd been drinking dye me for um about six about seven years before i got that illness and it had been completely full of magic i had uh, i would just think about something and it would happen for me and sometimes you know all kinds of just weird weird and wonderful very very magical um synchronicities had happened and paths had opened you know abracamino all over the place and so it was an opportunity for me to to really test it and you know my, i mentioned my interest in the philosophy of science and uh uh, like, uh, my, my degree was history and philosophy of science so the philosophy of science is, and the medicine is really interesting because people can uh, tell you that they believe all kinds of things but when they're actually sick or, and scared of dying is when you actually see what they what they really do believe and um, you know I had no reason to doubt Dime in all the time that it was working that things were going well for me and then when things started to go badly for me I was thinking well, am I going to am I going to now ditch this tradition which has uh, which has done nothing good but good for me so you know, I, I learned a lot. Um, I grew uh, a lot. My whole my whole worldview changed, and uh, came out the other side with um, uh, a new. Uh, my uh, towards the end of it, I got nursed back to health by a woman who used to dream the future, and you know that's a whole other story. Um, but we saw some saw some mental things. At one occasion, she dreamt about um, uh, a bunch of glass in a certain well in a certain place, and and and, and we went to. Uh, this place. We went to a place, and she announced that it was here. And then she did, in fact, dig up a whole bunch of bunch of glass. It was sacks and sacks of glass that she she just started digging madly at the ground and pulling out all these um, chunks of glass. And it turned out that a macumbero, a black magician, had buried this glass uh, in the seventies, and it had lain there um, forgotten about for years. Um, so I saw all this all this weird stuff. And anyway, so I came out with her, and with we had two kids. Um, uh, we had twins actually, and it was immediately after I recovered. I was celibate for the whole for the whole thing, and immediately after I recovered, I had a really interesting day when we were in. Uh, I had to skip the country because uh, my visa, my visa was totally out of date by that point. So we we went off to um, Bolivia and then off to Peru. And when we were in, I think it was I thought it was Bolivia, but she says it's Peru. And anyway, I went to the um, internet cafe one day, and uh two people had dreamt about me and they told me they'd, they'd email me to tell me they dreamt about me and one person emailed me to say that they had um they had just uh got pregnant and they were very happy and one emailed me to say they just had a kid and they're very happy and i emailed someone saying do you think if i went home and impregnated this woman all my problems would go away and i went back to the hostel and opened the door and the first thing she said to me was should we have a child and i said yes and uh we kind of we did basically and uh, she fell pregnant immediately and the two children that we had were both born, it was twins, and they were both born with birthmarks in the same place where I have my wound from that. That uh, is cool. The ulcer. Yeah, yeah that's, all, that's all expanded on in much more detail in a talk that I've got online somewhere or on my website, which is uh, it's called uh, Myth, Magic, Mind-Bending Medicine. And I can't remember, but lots of stuff beginning with M. Was the uh, what was the opinion of the daime folk around you while you were um, you know looking to oh two questions that one to cure the leishmaniasis and also um, when you watched Empire of the Serpent was it ah this takes me back? Um, well, okay, so that was when I first heard of leishmaniasis, and I think it's terrifying. Is, uh, <laughs> is, is the context for that? 
Yeah, it's pretty grotty. It's a nasty, nasty, it's a nasty illness, man. It does, it's not like a, um, it's not that painful. I mean, it hurts somewhat, and there's certain phases of it which hurt because you have to kind of, you have to put um, um, a bar or what do you call that stuff, like um, a mud pack on it. Basically, what happens is it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it swells in like a, in a kind of pus-filled boil uh, until you decide it's time to take the the the, the lid off it. And and then and you do that by sticking a mud pack on it, and you sleep with the mud pack on it. And in the morning, it drops off, and then you do the whole cycle over and over again. So you've got an, an open flesh wound again. And there's you know, but in terms of actually, it's not like getting malaria or something. It's not like massive fevers and sickness. It's just terrifying, you know. Um, it won't go away. And it was ten, it was eight months, and uh, I lost ten kilos. Like I said, one one stage I had worms crawling out of my. Uh, chest because it got it got infected with um something and i pulled a whole bunch of worms out of my chest and yeah really weird so to come back to your question what was the the opinion of the daimy folk around me the daimy folk around me it was in um i, I can probably say uh, a, a degraded lineage i think is, is probably what i would call it but um the they had lost track of the power of their own medicine and uh, they'd lost faith in it really and you know that part of Brazil went through massive changes in a very short amount of time, and when uh, when people from out of the country, but more, but actually people from the rest of the country who weren't caboclos, weren't from that particular region, arrived in the kind of sixties, seventies. They bought a whole load of stuff, including uh, everything from kind of clothes and types of clothes to perfume and a whole bunch of new ideas. And medicine was really in a, a very expansionist phase there. And now Brazil is the most medicalized country on earth, I think. The number of caesareans they have is completely absurd and they're all really, really into their pills and white coats and all that jazz. So the people around me thought I was crazy and they thought I was going to um, uh, either be massively disfigured or die. Uh, and they, were, they got very cross with me. They said, look, here, I'll, I'll get you, come into my car and we'll drive around the city and you can see all the people whose noses have fallen off, you know. And they, they um, I, I isolated myself completely in the end. I lived in a very small community and every, uh, you know, people would just say to me, every time they saw me, they'd be like, have you taken your injections yet? Have you taken your antimonium tartrate yet? And when I first got it, they said, you've got to take injections. You've got to take a heavy metal injection. I was like, no way I'm taking a heavy metal injection into my body. Um, and um, so, no, they were really, really uh, against it, um, uh, with a very few exceptions of uh, people who did help me out. And one of those who did help me out was a gentleman by the name of Padrino Nonato, who is the son of Padrino Wilson. This will mean something to people who know a bit about Daimi. And Padrino Wilson was the curandero of Mestre Reneo, who's the founder of Daimi. So he's a kind of man with lineage as a, as a great curandero. And I went to him. And I, don't, I tried to cure it in a different, um, I guess, a different uh, house, if you like, or a different lineage. And I went to him and I said, can you cure this? And he said, well, uh, you, you, no, not really. You should go to the hospital. You need to take your injections. And uh, I said to him something on the lines of, but I, but I thought you were a great current. Your father was a great curandero. I thought you were a great curandero. And he, you know, he kind of he said, OK, OK, uh, this is what you have to do. And he was just testing me to see if I was uh, so he had the gumption. He said, he said, here, first thing, don't listen to anybody. And he sung a particular line of a hymn to me, which is, um, which means always follow your path and um, let those who want to talk, uh, talk. And he made the gesture of covering his ears while he did it. So he said, very important that you don't listen to other people. Now you've made your decision. And he gave me some, um, some daimi, which was uh, a kind of an, an auspicious and, uh, um, a daimi that had been made quite a long time ago by a very fantastic person. And off we went. So he was um, so he was behind me with some persuasion. But no, the people around me, they thought I was nuts, to be honest. So you mentioned the uh, history and philosophy of science. Uh, mm. what, what's science getting wrong, uh, most wrong, I guess, about these compounds and allies? <laughs> um, most wrong, because <laughs> otherwise it's a five-hour podcast. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, well, I think how to approach them is, I think, uh, well, this is what comes to mind at the moment, because there was an article that just came out. Um, there's been a bunch of, of articles. I was particularly offended by one uh, recently published by Shakruna. Uh, it's entitled Racism and the Prejudice Against Cannabis by Ayahuasca Users in Brazil. And I've just written a... Uh, a, a rebuttal or a response to this article. But the problem, it's written by an anthropologist. Um, I won't mention his name here. But he, um, 
he's analysing Daimi from the from within the academy and in the and in anthropology basically it is forbidden for you to postulate the existence of invisible things uh entities all that kind of thing when i say forbidden like uh, just a very recent example anthropologist by the name of jack hunter um submitted an article submitted a chapter to a book i think the name of it was um the supernatural in history culture and something or other and his um his chapter was rejected and the editors got back to him and said there's nothing wrong with your chapter but um elsewhere in print you have uh collected evidence for the reality for the ontological existence i can't remember the exact term um that was used but uh the reality of uh of entities basically mm-hmm. now the idea which he can... has <laughs> anyway oh, carry on i know jack yeah, he's been on the show so yeah oh right cool um yeah he has and good for him you know exactly um, the idea the, so the idea that you can you know uh, anthropology has been racist from its uh, from its outset you know 19th century anthropology 20th century anthropology when great anthropologists were putting pygmies into cages and um exhibiting them at the zoo it's an incredibly racist well it has been an incredibly it's got an incredibly racist history and now that racism i think has kind of gone underground in a way uh the idea that um, you are not allowed to present evidence for something that um, brown people in the global south believe uh, is just quite fantastically neo-colonial, and I don't know, maybe it's postmodern as well. You know, I, yeah, um, extreme relativism. Couldn't agree more, and it it comes back to the entire um, psi spirit conversation because it's not just the brown people in the global south it's all people in all time except for the four percent that actually genuinely believe it who live today and they are and it's but you see it in the guardian articles and the rest of it even if they hand wave like you're sort of complimenting a child's finger painting on the fridge they hand wave like oh it's all right you can believe whatever you want but this is Mm. It's there in the subtext, which is, but as a matter of fact, you are wrong. And, uh, yeah. and we, for some reason, are correct. And it's that, it, uh, it's such a bizarre mind virus. If they actually had, if, what, one week of the, of the, um, degree that you actually did, they'd actually kind of probably be a little bit more humble with their racism. <laughs> Indeed. And I don't think humility is, uh, um, humility isn't part of the post-colonial exercise. You know, there's no. certain dogmas that are there, and they are dispassion. I mean, that's one. Uh, you're meant to be dispassionate when you argue about something. If you get cross because you actually care about what you're talking about, oh my god, you get into trouble. And I've got into so much trouble. Um, so, uh, what's so what's the worst thing? I could give you a whole list of, of of things which are awful about how about you know specifics about um where science has gone wrong but uh, it's the whole structure of it which is wrong i mean it's not no wrong is an incorrect word that's not fair um it produces all kinds of interesting things but it's a uh, spectacularly limited thing um, i mean i know you had bia bia labati on the uh, on the podcast a little while ago and it was a wonderful podcast to listen to and she was on bbc just the other day and they were talking about ayahuasca uh and they had this dude who was a psychiatrist um is on BBC Two, and and just to listen to the guys, um, there's a guy talking about you know these things haven't been tested. We haven't done double blind clinical blah 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 blah. And the the idea that if you do a double blind clinical trial on something that's been used for hundreds of years, if not more, if not thousands, uh, in the jungle, and then therefore it suddenly becomes something that's kosher. I mean, it's just it's just unbelievably arrogant. It's un- unexamined arrogance. And what do you do with unexamined arrogance? You know, the, it's and it's that unexamination that I find so frustrating because you're absolutely correct. And that it's trying to eat soup with a fork, as you say. There are some things that this set of protocols is very useful for, but if you use the fork for everything, um, it it just it doesn't it doesn't work. My father's a psychiatrist, and we had this conversation ages ago because he's actually. Um, because mother's an energy healer and and all that kind of channel and such. So he's sort of somewhere in the middle. But he says historically, uh, historically, from the history of medicine in the 20th century perspective, medicine's been suspicious of compounds that do more than one thing. So a psilocybin Mm. might, uh, for instance, instantly cure depression, which it does, but it also gets you high. And and you can't, it, it doesn't, 
have Ooh. the right set of into it doesn't isn't the right intellectual framework to turn that into a medicine and it's it, the whole thing is pathetic because as you say it's been done for um you know depending on the molecule or the plant ally um or mycelial ally uh it's been happening for hundreds if not thousands of years and the worst part you you, you turn it backwards and go, okay, Mr. Double Blind Trial, um, the only reason Prozac got onto the market was because they top-shelved the fact that it did nothing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you want to yeah. talk double blind trials? It's it's a fraudulent system. Mm. Yeah, indeed. indeed. It, it can't handle complexity. That's it. Yeah. You talk about, like, one one compound can do many things, and you look at something like ayahuasca, you know, in fact, one one of the guys on this on this show on uh, BBC Two, he was saying uh, the one of them said, you know, it's 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 uh, it's uh, what's the the important molecule there is DMT, and I was thinking, eh, well, and the other guy said, well, actually, it's not just DMT, it's 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 really um, this thing's got to be studied very deeply because actually, it's not just DMT, it's DMT plus an enzyme inhibitor. And you're thinking, actually, man, this is thousands and thousands of chemicals interacting with thousands of thousands of chemicals in your body, and you know, you can't. You, you can't take the the chemical out of the plant and you can't take the plant out of the jungle. Well, you can take the plant out of the jungle, but then you stick it in a lab away from... You know, when I did my cure, I had I was doing a whole load of ceremonies. I was also doing a whole load of prayers. And when I um, took... Uh, like, for example, when I went to go and get the cask... Uh, what do you call it? Is that an English word? The, uh, the bark of um, a cashew, cashew tree. I would make a poem up for the tree as I was harvesting it. Yeah. You can't do double blind trials on that kind of thing. No. And it comes to, you know, so um, I uh, mix with um, some academics. I haven't been kicked out of their gang just yet. Um, and uh, a particular list I'm on, the question was, was sent to the list that's, uh, or, or by, uh, by a layman who said, does ayahuasca cure cancer? And um, the uh, academics kind of um, rubbed at their beards for a while. And they, they got back to this. Uh, the person who asked the question, clearly someone who was dying of cancer. Uh, and said, there is no empirical evidence of ayahuasca curing cancer. The answer to the question, does ayahuasca cure cancer, if you are a psychiatrist from some university in the US, is, I don't know, go and ask somebody who does know. You know, I've got two friends who were diagnosed with terminal cancer, and this was we're going back decades now, and uh, they're absolutely fine, you know. It cured it for them, you know, you've got your N equals one group right there, yeah, absolutely. This uh what and it's interesting in that kind of no atheist in the foxhole sense that my experience with academia, particularly after Starships came out, was that uh, uh just going back to um Jack Hunter's experience that you just mentioned, uh it's this game because they all know it. Um they I I haven't I don't speak to that many anthropologists, but maybe five. They all know that there is a uh um the ontology of um you know academia of anthropology even after the you know uh, even after de castro and everything is still too limited for the reality of spirits uh or you know non-human persons or whatever you want to call it uh, they all know it and they're still playing this game as if it's like children playing dress up and i find it very frustrating yeah and imagine how frustrating it is if you know, people are dying as a result of it, yeah. or people aren't having their de <laughs> depression cured, or or whatever, you know. But um, I don't know. I don't want to get too riled up. Yeah. Was that <laughs> That's uh, too short? Was that? I mean, was that something you were interested in before you found Dimey? So, if you if this is what you did at university, for instance, was your particular focus on the role of psychedelic slash entheogen slash you know whatever term? Um, that isn't hallucinogen that you want to use for them. Um, was that a particular interest or was it the entire, mm. is it more about that borders and boundaries and conventions thing mm. from your childhood, which is like you have found a way of constructing reality that is in the modern day arbitrary because it was a 19th century sort of imperial power model and that's not really mm. in play anymore. Mm. So um, I think, I mean, I certainly think psychedelics had a an effect on the way I would approach the, the subject matter. Uh, I'm, I'm without, that's that's without a doubt. But no, I wasn't particularly interested. I didn't really know very much about how indigenous people handled their psychedelics and um, what the uh, you know what the power structures there were and. Um, 
uh, so no, I mean, I, I did uh, did my dissertation in. I was looking at Jehovah's Witnesses and comparing their beliefs on the body and uh, technology and sex with um, kind of seventeenth century American uh, puritanical groups. Basically, I was looking at people who were fascinated by the apocalypse or interested in the apocalypse, and that's that was really what what caught my attention was the apocalypse, and that's been my uh, overwhelming fascination for well, at least since I was a teenager in various different guises and exactly what the apocalypse means to me has changed over a long period. Uh, my last book is called Neuro Apocalypse and in that I'm looking at the unveiling uh, in terms of perception and neurobiology and also linguistics. So what do we see and what do we miss um, according to what language you speak, according to what we're scared of, according to what we're expecting? uh and uh, according to a whole load of other stuff um but no my interest in um i guess different modalities health, health modalities was not i mean my mum is uh, an acupuncturist so that always interested me from that perspective um and i was uh, kind of fascinated by the arguments that've gone o- gone on over homeopathy for example over indian medicine um it's it's coming back to that thing about convention. Why you know, why do people take pills from a white bottle rather than stick pins in their arms? And a lot of it is because of real politics. Yeah, you know, and it, and you know, we we often talk about co- colonialism as if it's uh, as if it's something about bodies and if it's something about territory. And yes, it certainly is about bodies and it's about territory. But almost almost more terrifying is the colonialism of the mind. And there's a, there's a fantastic book. It's by Ethan Waters called uh, Crazy Like Us. I can't remember the subtitle, but it's something like the exportation of um, the American psychiatric model or something like that. And he looks at different case studies, and one of them is PTSD in the wake of, um, in the wake of the tsunami, basically. All these... Uh, aid groups went over in their thousands to try and help in inverted commas uh, third world people deal with the trauma (laughs) that uh, that that was left in the wave of in the wake of the tsunami and they were entirely uninterested in the models for dealing with trauma that was already there and i'll give you an example i think it's from sri lanka but these groups arrived in, in sri lanka and um, they, they, you know, they found that uh, people who'd lost their houses and, and everything would go off to the refugee camps and they stay there for a few days. And then they go, I want to go back to my community. And the aid workers would say, no, 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 you haven't processed it properly yet. Uh, have some more Zoloft and uh, let's talk to you. Let's do some talking therapy, even though we don't understand your language. And they were like, no, 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 we need to go back to my community. Because they saw the locus of the damage uh, in the connections between people. Whereas the kind of PTSD diagnosis, which is actually younger than I am, I'm 40 years old, PTSD is younger than me, um, was uh, they saw the locus of the problem in the psychology of the individual. And the symptoms were very different as well. So, for example, the, the, people, um, uh, the people there complained of, of joint pain, right? Now, that's not part of the PTSD diagnosis, joint pain. But it's quite interesting because joints are the parts of your body which connect up two different limbs or two different parts of the body so that kind of fascinates me and also obviously as a hypnotherapist when you see all kinds of um all kinds of uh problems medical problems whatever they often symbolically manifest something uh psychological and even cosmological if that makes sense yeah well it it does to this audience that's for sure uh you mentioned that you know, it, it took a while just because it wasn't what you were studying at the time to become uh, interested in, I guess, indigenous modes of interacting with, um, you know, various allies and, and non-human persons and so on. But uh, let's let's indigene ourselves. Uh, Danny, are there any drugs in the Bible? Oh, wow. Um, well, yeah, there's a stack of drugs in the Bible. I mean, where, where, where to begin? Uh, gold, frankincense and myrrh. I mean, gold. We can leave that one aside, although that does certainly make people mad. But um, frankincense, frankincense is uh, as a GABA receptor agonist, works on the same system as the Valium uh, and all that. Uh, it doesn't work in the same way as Valium. It's much more pleasant. Actually, I'm not familiar with Valium. I can't say that. Um, wouldn't be an empirically sound statement. But um, it's, uh, yeah, the dosage. The best way to learn about these things is to eat them, really. So the dosage for frankincense is about the size of two peas, as in two garden peas. So a bunch of grain, a few grains to make about that volume 
if you have much more than that you'll start to offend the intestine or the flora in your intestines so yeah uh, frankincense uh, works on the GABA system myrrh works on the opioid system mu and delta opioids um there are stacks of drugs in the bible there's um the anointing oil is um is an interesting stuff it's called shemen hamishcha and mishcha comes from the word masha and masha means uh to wipe or to paint it's where we get the massage from in fact and so the anointing oil was 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 something that was massaged into uh into people specifically into priests and kings it was massaged into them in order to give them an experience of yahweh and it contains cassia and cinnamon and um myrrh and canair bosom which um, i won't go into here but it's basically cannabis i mean speculative but it's not really a great speculation everyone in the region use cannabis yeah and um uh, there's lots of reasons it would be it would be honest. more surprising if it wasn't it would be more surprising if it was absent from palestine rather than found in palestine yeah well it- it was um palestine was on a trade route basically and it wasn't found in egypt well it was found in egypt but it wasn't grown in egypt so it had to come in through palestine and caner bosom uh is described as from a faraway place uh in the bible so uh yeah definitely the scythians had it and the greeks had it and the persians had it and the uh assyrians had it and everyone had it really um but what's kind of interesting, yeah, there are stacks and stacks of drugs in the Bible. There's mandrake, there's this, there's that and the other. But what's really interesting is the technologies of combination. So that massage oil, for example, it contains cinnamon and cinnamon contains eugenol, which is what you make MDMA out of. And cassia contains estrogel, which is described as having an electric LSD like effect. But those two compounds are broken down by your enzymes, P450 enzymes. So those enzymes need to be inhibited if you're going to get anything out of those plants and the way that you inhibit them is with other plants uh and it's just the combination which is described in the bible which contains both inhibitors and um uh what do you call it these these uh powerful psychedelic um compounds which is which is quite interesting the, go sorry you, you took a deep breath i did them. i did well <laughs> uh, just for people like i this uh, uh, a presentation you gave at Breaking Convention was put up on YouTube where we um, the premium members uh, have just finished up the journeying course and I got to the bit where we were talking about the use of you know journeying aids in in recorded history and that was one of them and uh, I like from uh, Masha and what you were saying Meshia like um, the Messiah means anointed and it's that kind well more or less so um, yeah. you. What you find in the Bible is essentially a uh, a psychedelic anointing oil, and you also have the idea of God in a human person uh, associated with an oil that, in some instances, is psychedelic. And uh, mm. it's, it's it's lovely pieces. But the bit that I thought was, um, when you talk about the technology of it, if you want to tell people about the tabernacle incense, because I'll have the presentation linked up below um, the podcast for people listening, uh, if they go to runesoup.com. But... Uh, I have, I've been to that party, put it that way. You've been in the tabernacle? Well, I've been in a hot box tent growing up. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> you know, you've got to make your own fun growing up in regional Australia. Oh. And oh. Uh, yes, uh, getting really, really high in a tent in a paddock rather than a desert, been there. Right, okay, well, good for you. Um, so, yeah, back in the day before the pipe was introduced to the Middle East, the way people got high was by hotboxing tents, as, uh, as you say. So the Scythians, for example, would, would, uh, were described in about the 5th century BC by Herodotus, who visits them. He says they folded down the flaps of their tents and they threw cannabis on the fire. And as the steam came up, they would jump up and shout for joy. And it's better than any Grecian vapor bath. So this was quite um, well-known technologies. <coughs> all over the world actually so you find it in in china you find it in uh, the oracle at delphi in her cave hotboxing the cave as well but in the bible there are about five chapters given over to describing the tabernacle the dwelling pa- place of yahweh on earth right and nothing in the bible gets anything like that kind of um, detail that you know the 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 the, 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 the tower of babel is over in about half a chapter and you know the ten commandments which is a, another point there are actually ten of them and they're not commandments but let's leave that one behind um that gets kind of half a chapter here and half a chapter there but you get five chapters and it describes this piece of kit um and it describes everything about it it describes its dimensions it describes what everything's made of it describes how big the hooks are and the and the and how many rings there are and how 
Uh, it's massive. You know, it's really, really intricate how, how it's described. And, and what you end up with is a tent. And at the back of that tent is a chamber. And that chamber has an acacia frame. Uh, everything's made out of acacia. Acacia, by the way, is the highest concentration of DMT in the region. So you've got a box, an acacia um, frame. And around that frame uh, are four um, materials, skins and materials. Uh, so two of them are pulled tight around that frame, and then another two of them are kind of pulled as a as a, as a kind of windbreak. So you've got a you've got a, you've got a, um, a chamber there uh, with these leather. One one of the um, materials is something that shoes were also made out of. So we know it's a thick leather of some description, and you end up with a three and a half meter cubed box, basically at the back of the tabernacle, and. There's a veil at the entrance to it, and and certainly in the time of the temple, the veil is described in the Talmud as the thickness of a man's hand, right? Which raises a question. If the veil was there to keep prying eyes out, why would it need to be so thick? And if the veil was there to keep Yahweh in, well, a bit of leather isn't going to do it, surely, um, if you conceptualize Yahweh as this kind of mighty, uh, mighty war god. So what the veil would have done was it would have made an airtight chamber in the back of the tabernacle. And the only thing that was done in, the, in, the, in that chamber was the high priest would go in after he had been anointed with this anointing oil, which contains all these interesting psychoactive, psychedelic compounds. And he would go in with a sensor and um, handfuls of finely ground incense. So we're not talking about a little stick of uh, patchouli or something. It's, it's handfuls of incense. And inside that room is the magic box, the Ark of the Covenant, and and he would burn uh, incense, and it, it kind of describes how the cloud will cover the Ark uh, and the mercy seat, and, and and how Yahweh will speak from within the cloud, or how the angels will appear in the cloud, and it's described in that kind of language. So it was used exclusively for burning incense and for talking to angels. And now that um, incense contains about 16 ingredients and i'm just going to uh, run through them here you've got um onica we don't know what that is but uh, galbanum which is a gab agonist you've got frankincense which is a gab anarchist, uh, anarchist uh, agonist you've got myrrh which works in the opioid system you've got cassia which contains estradiol that electric lsd lsd like stuff spicanard which is very interesting that's the stuff that jesus's feet are washed in and that boosts gaba and it boosts uh, dopamine and it boosts um, serotonin as well. It's described as a nootropic, which means it helps you remember things, which is quite interesting because they are they, they they this thing was this kit was used for the high priest to connect with angels and to get information. It was a divination box, basically divination by psychoactive smokes, and it's you need to remember stuff that you divine, obviously. And then it's got saffron in it, um, saffron. What does that uh, contain? That's a GABA agonist as well. And you've got Costas, um, which is, I think that one works in the opioid system. Um, and what else have you got? Uh, uh, cinnamon and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it's a whole, uh, sorry, I made a mistake. It's actually a four and a half meter cube chamber. Um, so you've got a whole stack of these incenses and um off the high priest would go on his own, right? Which is a shamanic format. But back in the day, before kind of ayahuasca tourism and that, the shaman would go off on his own or her own into their tent with their magical objects and their yeah. familiar spirits, and then they'd come back with uh, stuff, often stuff of war divination. You know, when do we attack? When do we retreat? When do we ambush? Um, which is what Moses or the high priest would come out of the tabernacle with. He said, "Okay, now it's time to move." And now in that story in the uh, in the Bible, they follow a pillar of smoke, right? A pillar of smoke. And we tend to get the idea that this pillar of smoke appears from above the tabernacle, uh, the back of the tabernacle, because when you see cheesy Christian evangelical websites, that's how they draw it. But it actually, in, in terms of the text, it appears at the door of the of the tabernacle. So this guy goes into his uh, goes into the chamber. And when he comes out, he opens his thick veil, and then they open the thin veil, and this smoke comes pouring out of the tabernacle. And one of the things that it contains is Nebtadini pyrotechnica, and um, that is the Hebrew word for that uh, means that which causes smoke to rise. It's the stuff that's used in fireworks. 
Um, I think it's to make them fly straight. I'm not sure, um, but it it make yeah basically it makes smoke rise. And it's described in in kind of um, uh, ancient texts how the rising of the smoke is a good sign. So you can imagine the scene: um, this pillar of smoke appears at the uh, front of the tabernacle, and then out comes the high priest. And he says, "Right, pack up your stuff, and off we go." So we get this, you know the, the Bible talks about following the pillar of smoke. Um, I think what we're talking about there is the people following the shaman and the shaman getting his information from the pillar of smoke. Yeah, and this uh, there's a variant of the history and philosophy of science when it comes to Bible studies and, and early archaeology, which is uh, Victorians were very squeamish about a lot of things, and uh, and Bible studies is um, very much the sort of kind of hobby of retired vicars back in the day. So there's uh, there's a squeamishness about looking at these things which uh, doesn't match the historical evidence, because you have other examples like mana and the possibility that, um, I mean, the apocalypse of St. John looks like a psychedelic vision and there's a cave involved. And, and if you widen it out to the sort of Eastern Mediterranean at the time, everyone was, you, you would take opium for a toothache. So the idea that they weren't, uh, the idea that they didn't have more nuance in which allies were used where as just a baseline i mean they don't have mm. they don't have drug and vegetable and uh categorizations the way we do and it just seems like and the other thing i think it's important for people listening because this comes back to how we conceptualize them uh if you were to try to describe the use of uh, mind-altering uh, components of something like tabernacle ritual, the implication when you write about it in the 21st century is that it's um, fraudulent, like the wizard, uh, the Wizard of Oz, where the well, this is this is how they deluded themselves into thinking that they were talking to God. That's not correct. Mm. Like even if the even if the um, the sort of use of I forget what it was called that makes the smoke go up. You just mentioned it. Uh, it was Nettadini Pyrotechnica. Yeah, so that would have been deliberately used because God has to get back up, um, having come down to say hello. So you look at it and go, they're even conceptualizing it. It's not like they were bamboozled by the mm. use of these molecules. They knew f well, they wouldn't have molecules, but they knew full well that these substances could do things. It's just that they've mm -hmm. characterized them differently. Indeed, and they had taboos around how you use them as well. So in the Bible, it says, don't don't drink strong drink before you go into the tabernacle. Uh, and when you're in the tabernacle, when the oil is upon you, don't go out of the tabernacle, you know, and it's very good advice for any psychedelic session, you know, don't get don't get smashed beforehand. And don't go stumbling through the streets once you're once you're under the effect. But um, you kind of raise an interesting question there, because um, does it mean that Yahweh is a product of allyl benzene psychopharmacology? And I would, I would kind of respond to that by saying, you know, I wear glasses, and when I put my glasses on, people's faces come into focus, and when I take them off, they're not in focus. Absolutely. Does that mean? Does that mean that my glass, that your face is a is a product of my glasses? No, it doesn't. Um, I personally uh, believe that these forces described in the Bible, and they are forces. That's the word for them, Elohim or powers. Um, are different um, drives that move in our heads and possibly outside our heads, but most importantly in our heads. And one of those is is the Yahweh drive, which is the drive to love your friends and to hate, hate your enemies and to expand and to take territories. And um, that fortifies you in some ways and it hoodwinks you in other ways. And in the in the text, you've got other ones as well. You've got El Shaddai, for example. There's an interesting one. He's the guy who tells um abraham to sacrifice his son you know which is what reptiles do uh, snakes eat their children um mammals don't right um el shaddai is really interested in uh, increase he's interested in territory uh that kind of thing whereas and so so he says to abraham sacrifice your son so abraham goes off and goes yeah right and then the angel of yahweh comes along who's a different god in fact the, the emissary of a different god and says don't sacrifice your son sacrifice somebody else um, so it's a kind of, you quite often get this in the Bible, you get one God name will say one thing, and then one God name will say another. And then you get the prophets, who I believe are uh, a, a later stage of the brain, if you like, the, the frontal lobes, which inhibit Yahweh. So, for example, Yahweh uh, wants to annihilate the tribe, but Moses says, don't do that, you know, remember the good old days, this be far from thee to do. And Yahweh repented of the evil, the evil, that's the word in the Bible, which he sought to do. 
so this idea of yeah, you know good god and bad god this comes much much later we're talking you know in the revelation of saint john there's a kind of um there's there's something of all those kind of gods getting um mashed up together and then in and then in christianity generally you get a kind of dichotomy of the prince of darkness against um the against the really good guy but you, you look at the text you know it's not even monotheistic back in the day you've got ah we could we could go no, on for well, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah, well, I agree completely. So, in, in the sort of premium member weekly chats we do, uh, I go to pains to describe the Christian God specifically as uh, Greco Palestinian Egyptian, because you you have that kind of mushing together into monotheism as a sort of classical artifact. But if you read the actual Bible, and if you read, um, I you know, a general Jewish mythology and different versions of um, the stories of different angels. It is crazy town, and it's fantastic. It's this big, delightful mm. mess. And, uh, you know, typically in the magical community, people reject something like um, Christianity or examining biblical mythology because they've grown up in some happy, clappy monstros- monstrosity in the U.S. And uh, mm. it's so much more interesting than that. If you're, like, you could certainly be pagan, but remember that, this stuff is as pagan as it gets so you you don't have to go and find it you you can go and find it if you resonate with it but remember that you are situated in something that couldn't be more crazy pagan yeah so you get you get lines in exodus like uh you know now i know that yahweh is more powerful than all the gods of egypt and that's not monotheism not by a long shot I guess one of the things which really interests me there is what happened when the language changed from Hebrew to, uh, well, kind of Aramaic and Greek. Uh, so Hebrew is uh, Afroasiatic language and is very much more poetic, for one thing, as in words can mean completely different things according to how you pronounce them. And it also, it doesn't have this kind of abstract third person singular that Greek and uh, Latin and English has. So, for example, uh, in Hebrew, um, or, or rather in uh, in English, you know, when it's raining, you say um, uh, you say it's raining. You know, it rains. So, what exactly is the uh, is that it? And um, what is what's cold when it's cold, or what's awful when it's awful? Now, in in Hebrew, in Greek, that's the case because that third person singular is there. Now, in Hebrew, that is not the case at all. So, for example, uh, in Hebrew, it is uh, yored, uh, yored Geshem, which means falling rain. So it's the rain itself, which is the agent, right? Um, so you have all these Hebrew by its very grammar postulates different forces with different powers, if you understand what I mean. Whereas Indo-European language is kind of almost force the existence of one greater power yeah, it's, which does it's a whole lot of other things. Built for monism and 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 built for a centralization of agency, which um, makes these things very confusing. I think some Greek translations have done a reasonable job of um, attempting to have more than one meaning in the words. Uh, but yes, it's it's an eternal translation challenge, and it's really exciting that. Um, it's really exciting to discover if you've grown up in a what you would maybe have considered either disappointing or barren, uh, you know, a spirituality. Even if you even if you don't resonate with it, it's uh, almost like an ancestral exercise to realize just how crazy and uh, and um, magical uh, the stuff that the stuff that's always been there. That maybe even if you missed it, it's still there. Mm, so all, all of that stuff is described in my second book, Neuro uh, Neuro Apocalypse. Um, uh, what I wanted to say there was that the Greek text, right? So if you look at the um, the Gospel of John, for example, has got some extraordinary poetry in it. So the Greek has to do through the arrangement of words what Hebrew can do with the actual words themselves, if you like. I'll give you a quick example of that. So um, there's this line in Genesis. It's Genesis 3, first line, which goes, and the snake was more subtle than any creature which Yahweh Elohim had made. Right Now, that word subtle is the same Hebrew letters as a word in the previous line, which is, and, um, and the man and the woman, I think that's what it says, the man and his wife were, were naked and they were not afraid. And that word naked and the word subtle are the same word. It's um, 
what is the word? Um, oh God, it's completely slipped my mind there. Um, it'll come back to me in a moment. But it's um, uh, it's completely the same word, which means uh, both naked and subtle. When you think about subtle describing the snake, who's the bad guy, and you think about naked describing the innocence of the couple, uh, and the way that Hebrew works. Um, the way you uh, pronounce things is set by the vowels, and the vowels don't exist until about the 7th century AD when they were set by these kind of reactionary, the Masorites, who decided this was how the text is um, is meant to, meant to be understood. So the words are arum and arom. So arum is subtle, and arom is naked, but it's, it's written in exactly the same way. So Hebrew, you can do that kind of stuff. Now, you can't really do that in Greek. But you can do it in terms of poetry. So the beginning of John. So John begins with in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, according to Aristotelian thought, the, the, the laws of logic, if you like, something either is or it isn't. And it can't be both one thing and the other. So the idea of the logos being both with God and God is an affront to Aristotelian uh, logic and it's a front to logic generally how can something be something and with something uh, at the same time and in fact everyone who talked about the Logos um, Heraclitus for example um, Philo all of these people whenever they talk about the Logos they talk about it in terms of paradoxes they, uh, they say for example Philo says uh, it's the glue and chain which brings everything together and it's also the, d- the divider of all, of all things so it's that which brings together and that which separates apart. So I think what I was saying with what you can do with um, what what you have to what you can do with words, specific words in Hebrew, you have to do with word constructions in Greek. But it is in there. It's very much in there in the text. And you get kind of interpretations of John one, which are just I mean, how can you look at that extraordinarily? It's beautiful poetry. It's absolutely beautiful poetry, and make that boring. You know, yeah. and that's what. That's what Christians have managed to do. Terrible. It's, it is like hats off to them in in many respects. Like, <laughs> how, how did you? It's like, um, you know, it's like ruining Star Wars. I mean, you really, you really went to some effort to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we're talking about all, all the way back to convention again. You know, why why do we believe, or why why do we what, what we do believe? Why do the Catholic Church believe that Thomas ch- touched touched Jesus? Right, the whole idea of doubting Thomas. You know, that line is extraordinary because because Thomas goes to touch Christ arisen and then he says, oh, my God. And there's nothing about whether he touches or or doesn't touch. Right. Now, the popes came along and they said he touches. That's the dogma, um, you know, resurrection in the flesh and all that jazz and all the kind of Gnostic text which talked about Jesus walking without leaving footprints and Jesus appearing in visions like he did in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, for example, um, all that kind of stuff gets flushed away because you can't control an empire if you've got people who are taking instructions from uh, visions and uh, invisible voices and things like that. But if you look at that line uh, where it talks about um, Thomas touching flesh, the, the very line beforehand, Jesus walks into a room where all the doors are closed. You know, So you don't have to look very far into the text to see exactly exactly the opposite of what the what the councils and what the popes um fabricated not fabricated it's all a fabrication but what they constructed as a suitable set of conventional beliefs with which to govern an expanding empire and it's that bit that then tumbled down through protestantism to become the kind of dire flyover mega church uh, american experience and and by that point there is like the water coming out of the tap is is all feces <laughs> there's there's no actual <laughs> water in it at that point and for me i think we're in a kind of the beginnings of a golden age and we'll sort of wind up with this and then and do the next steps we're in the beginning of a golden age where uh, 18th, 19th century uh, biblical studies was retired Anglican vicars. Uh, parts of the 20th century, particularly in the post-war, um, you know, post Nag Hammadi and so on, there's a brief flowering there in the 60s where people had kind of like Jungian inspiration. And then we gave it to the kind of officially materialist, it, it gets caught in that sort of postmodern, the same stuff that's trapped anthropology in, in its inability to talk about spirits. But here we are in the 21st century and there are um, 
new discoveries and new interpretations and new research and so on that's been sort of jailbroken and uh and it's it's a very exciting time and i think something i think there's an urgency to it for people who've who've grown up within this culture particularly in its inert state there's almost a responsibility to bellows breathe some magic back into it even if it's not your particular road Mm. And, I, and i like the fact that you brought up the anthropology there because um because it goes straight it goes beyond christianity it's, uh it goes into the very idea that there is one truth and you know if you have a double blind study you reckon you can uncover what that truth is you go right back to the kind of um the very first translation of the old testament into greek there's a there's a legend about it there's two legends about it um one of them is that um 70 scholars the, the the old testament is said to have 70 faces for every different interpretation of verse so 70 scholars uh went off and they all made a translation into greek and they all miraculously produced the same translation so that's the first miracle the second miracle is when when the text was translated um then the world goes dark for three days and it's described in the talmud the bible in translation the old testament in translation is described as a lion in a cage you know a lion in a cage that kind of power uh constrained and that that idea of of one truth rather than rather than 70 different ways to read everything has gone right through into into science it's gone into law it's gone into morality it's gone all the way through our our system and it's all i think i hope i i i, I pray even it's all breaking down it's breaking down you know you look at the two slit experiment or wherever you look you look at quantum weirdness one place you can look but also you know getting away from these um uh, what was it you mentioned? The 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 four percent of um of uh, I can't remember what you said actually. Was, now, yeah, four percent of the world's population actually, because it's it's still a minority in uh, Western cultures. This kind of Guardian Easter, uh, Richard Dawkins uh, atheism that it's basically science journalists and other idiots who don't understand science <laughs> that uh, yeah. believe this stuff. So you got like a four percent of the world's population right now, and somehow that's correct. So this is what I find wonderful about, about science, really. Actual scientists, I say actual scientists, are often moved by revelation. So yeah. whether it's Calvin, who discovered the Calvin cycle, which is the substrate that, uh, that um, you know, the series of chemicals which, which make a cycle which captures sunlight and makes it, uh, and makes it into energy or rather makes it into a storable form of energy. That was, he put, you know, he got that in about 20 seconds whilst he was waiting for his wife uh, in, uh, in a car park. He wasn't thinking about it. And, you know, Tesla is a great example of someone who just uh, had visions of, you know, the AC motor or something like that. But there's, there's a stack of examples, some of them with psychedelics. Uh, we're talking about that, that guy who discovered Carrie Mullis, for example. That's another one. There's loads and loads of them. So revelation in science You've got this wonderful, wonderful thing that happens in science and uh, you get you get the revelation in science and then you get a kind of whole layer of priestcraft. And that's like um, your journal editors and so on and so on and so forth, saying what you can say and what you can't say. And then you get a layer of um, kind of capitalism, basically, which is marketing it to people who don't who didn't have the revelation, didn't understand it. And what I find absolutely fascinating about that progression is that you find exactly the same thing in the different layers of text which went into writing, making the Bible. No, so you've absolutely. got you've got four layers of text. Well, four layers of text, but the first two you might talk. You might they're they're legends. They're they're kind of cycles of legends, and they seem to be received or they seem to be revelation in some sense. Uh, they're written in kind of uh, this is according to kind of textual scholars. But 10th century BC, probably in around the 8th century BC. And then a whole lot of stuff happens, a whole lot of political stuff happens. By the end of it, you've got a completely different society. And then the priests move in and you get a whole layer of priestcraft put over that. And uh, as the texts get combined, there's this whole new um, a new text. It's called the priestly document that goes in. And then you get the Deuteronomist. So you get Deuteronomy, which is all about um, kind of property law. It's all about law, basically. The first layer, you've got one law. And that is don't eat blood. And then by the end of it, you've got laws about absolutely everything. And they always defend the property owning class. You wanted to improve revelation, you would actually, well, improve revelatory encounter rates between the unconscious and the conscious, maybe to re-describe it. You'd study it because it's um, it's very difficult to find a transformative moment in science that hasn't been uh, numinous 
Uh, and and my mm. cousin, she's moved back to Australia now, but she was an Oxford ax- astrophysicist, and she's also a churchgoer and a fellow spectrum dweller. Uh, and what she was staying with us, this is back when I was in Chiswick, and she was staying with us, uh, and I thought, I'm going to... I'm going to poke on this because here is an Oxford astrophysicist who is also a churchgoer. So I gave her the like, what's going on? Like, what's God? Or, you know, how are you how are you looking out through those radio telescopes and also going and reading this book? And it was the most and gloriously bug wild reasoning of, you know, how she puts these two things together. And I think this is why I refer to the sort of four percent ish as an approximation guardian reader types, because. I have not met a scientist, and I have them in the family, who don't have, who like who thinks that's a credible belief system. Who thinks that sort of nineteenth century materialist scientism that you know Islamophobic booksellers tweet about. Uh, mm. They they don't think it's credible, and they also it doesn't bother them. Like they're busy doing the actual science and 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 seeing a much. I mean, they're crazy. My my cousin's crazy, as we all are. But she's also not a scientismist. She's a, she's mm-hmm. a scientist, and that I think people miss when we talk about uh, how quote unquote science is expressed in popular culture and media and 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 so on. It's this really dumbed down control mechanism that doesn't even accurately reflect science. It, it's just some sort of 19th century ghost. Yeah, indeed. And then you get people like uh, Gerald Schroeder, for example, the guy who wrote The Science of God. And he's, I think he's MIT, but he's like, he's an astrophysicist and a you know, cosmologist uh, and, uh, and an Orthodox Jew. And he looks into the days of creation in uh it's it's extraordinary i mean it's absolutely brilliant the way he combines his uh his cosmology and uh, and physics with uh with the bible but it's high level stuff you know it, it's um it's not kind of half wits bashing together ideas like uh like kind of children bashing together blocks <laughs> yeah that's pretty much a very good way of describing it <laughs> well Danny, this has been a fantastic chat. I uh, love this, uh, and it all timed very well for premium members uh, with your presentation at Breaking Convention, which people will see below this, and uh, and your research and so on. So for people who would like to know more, uh, what do they do, where do they go, and so on? Uh, right, well, they go to uh, my website, which is www.sorry. Yes, you know that bit. Uh, Nemu's End, N E M U S E N D dot co dot UK. There's a bunch there. Um, there's a bunch of talks and stuff. You can look at uh, what do you call it? You can look at um, Psychedelic Press website. They've got um, my stuff there. And yeah, Breaking Convention, as you said. I've got a Funzig talk on, that's the 9th of November. That's Thursday. Uh, in London. That's the next one coming up. I'm giving like talks all over the place, really. And you can check out my two books. So my first one is called Science Revealed. That one is about revelation in science. And um, it's also about the political machinations of scientific institutions. So how journals uh, select things, how funding is allocated, how scientific tro- controversies are settled completely outside of scientific means so through bullying and through censorship and all that kind of jazz and that goes into a little bit about the politics of truth and the very idea of truth and then my second book neuro apocalypse um which is a um i'm very very i'm very proud of that book that's a that's a lovely book um but that looks at um perception how how we see what we see what we miss what uh, so part of it is a comparison between the Japanese language and the English language. What do Japanese people see? What do they remember? Part of it looks at how expectation influences what we see. So, for example, if you point at a slope and you ask someone to estimate the slope, if they're old and unfit, they're more likely to overestimate it. Whereas if they're young and fit, they're more likely to underestimate it. Uh, but if they're young and fit and carrying a heavy bag, they're more likely to overestimate it. So I'm looking at how the the visual scene and also other other senses are influenced by what's going on in our heads and then that kind of goes through and it talks about um it does talk about psychedelics as well uh that kind of goes off on one really that's that's uh so that's new apocalypse check that one out as well splendid and uh and this stuff will all be linked up in the show notes marvelous yeah and there's some other there's, there's some other uh, titles on psychedelic press which are definitely worth checking out so check out the psychedelic press website as well 
Awesome. Well, Danny, I've kept you for long enough. Uh, it's been a great chat. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Gordon. There you go. Psychedelics, culture, history, language, and flesh-eating bacteria. Really splendid stuff. There are some fine goodies in the show notes this week, including several of Danny's prior presentations. So if you're listening on a smartphone, be sure to check them out when you get near a computer. And once you're near a computer, you may as well subscribe to the show on YouTube or the site at runesoup.com, or check out the RuneSoup Facebook page, and lucky last, find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.